Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Hear these words. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now they were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in their native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Phamphia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy and I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and smoky mist the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word Happy Pentecost Sunday. Today I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, the advocate, the advocate. Every summer I take on a learning project with my son. We're out of school, we don't have to do homework. Let's do something else. Let's uh, build your independent living skills. And so about five years ago, we decided that that summer, my son would learn how to ride his bike independently. It sounded like an achievable goal. And let me tell you, he was all in. The former Christmas, he had gotten a brand new red bike. It was beautiful, it was pretty, it was nice, except it hadn't really been driven. It hadn't been ridden, it hadn't been pedaled. We chose the alley for privacy and safety and then it began, crash after crash after crash. It was hard letting him go knowing what was to be the outcome, crash. At some point over the next two days, he announced he had lost his interest. But giving up is not an option. And so with a little cheerleading, we went out again. I would give him a push as hard as I knew how and yell, pedal, pedal. And on that day, it worked. He pedaled and then he crashed. The disciples had been riding on the coattail of Jesus. No matter how bad things got, they could always turn to Jesus. He was their ram in the bush. They had never really peddled independently on their own, and they were scared. 
I imagine they wanted to give up. If there was no food, he would feed them. If there was no water, he would quench their thirst. If they were tired, he was their hookup. If life's waves rumble, he'd speak to the waves, peace be still. If they had a hit, hiccup, he had a pickup. If they had a mess up, he was there to clean it up. If there was an argument, he would share a parable. If they got off track, he'd get them back on track. They were in each other's faces a lot. In the words of Whitten Houston, they would turn to Jesus. And after all their strength was gone, they looked to Jesus to be strong. They turned to his skills and his capacity and his talent and his ability and his resources. When all was said and done, the disciples turned to Jesus. And Jesus, like all good teachers, like all good parents, declared it was time to let them go. You got to get off this tit today. You got to leave the security of this home today. You have to go out into the world today. There's a shift and it's time for you all to ride your own bikes. It's time for you to pedal. And it couldn't have been easy for Jesus to let them go like that, but it was right. And so he pushes them in the direction he wants them to go and the disciples crash. The disciples were afraid. They were scared. Years ago, I visited another church for their anniversary. I was drawn to the speaker, Bishop Yvette Flunder, an ally for the LGBT community. And so when I heard she was in town, I decided I had to go. And so it seemed she had been their speaker before on an anniversary date. And she began to talk about growth with this congregation. She knew them well. They had a relationship. She talked about how often, year after year, people are in the exact same places. They are still needing prayer. They are still victims. They are still doubters. They are still letting critical thought and doubt rent rooms in their head. They are still sucking milk from human bodies. They are still crying and complaining about the same things. And she challenged them, when I come back, I need to see growth. I need to see movement. As a pastor, I got it. All this talk about inviting in Jesus this month, and now this talk about the Holy Spirit implies there ought to be some change in our life. There ought to be some growth in our life. People who haven't seen us in a while, when they see us, ought to see a difference in our spiritual walk. It's time to pedal. At my former church, the pastor before the pastor before the pastor came back one Sunday, and he was happy to be back. He walked around with pride and said, everything looks the same. He explained how he himself had gutted the church. He explained the chairs that he had made, the carpet he had put down, the rugs, and on and on and on he went. And I felt some kind of way. You see, when the pastor before the last pastor before that pastor comes back, there ought to be some visible change. You see, after having been gone for that amount of years, there ought to be some change, some new carpets, some new chairs, some new hymnals, some new people, some new ministries. There ought to be some change, some biking, some pedaling, but everything looks the same. It's good to remember where we've come from and how we were and who we were and how God brought us out and saved us and delivered us, but we can't stay there. In the Old Testament, there were so many days a guest could stay and be considered a guest, and then they had to go. It's good to remember the good old days, but we can't stay there. If COVID did nothing else, it reminded us that we can't stay in the spaces we are. There's more growth to occur, more advancing to occur, more dreaming forward to occur, more envisioning anew to occur because where God wanted to take them, where God wanted to take the disciples, they had never been before. They were stuck having never rode a bike, but God wanted more for them than they wanted for themselves. You can't stay there. It's time for us to move. And so in the text today, the time has come for the disciples to take off their training wheels, and they are being left to bike. But not yet. Jesus says, wait for it. I'm sending you an advocate, wait for it. I'm sending you someone who will always have your back, wait for it. I'm sending you a comforter so that you won't get discouraged, wait for it. I'm sending you one who will help you speak the language of those you serve, wait for it. I'm sending you one who will lead and guide you in the wilderness, wait for it. I'm sending you one who will help you spread your wings, wait for it. Sometimes we're so impatient and God is saying, wait for it. 
wait for it. I'm sending you one who will help you to feel more confident in your mission. Wait for it. I'm sending one who will help you to be bold. Wait for it. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit up in here. Wait for it. You just got to you gotta wait for it. And when it comes, and when that advocate comes, you start pedaling. Pedal. Pedal. Yesterday, I was at the UCC campsite, uh, Tower Hill, and I walked over to Lake Michigan, and it was, it was hot. It was just hot as the dickens. I'm going to be PG today. I trudged through the forest and the mud and the sand and a small creek, but finally what emerged was Lake Michigan and then the hot sand, and I walked up to the water, and I just stood there, and I allowed the cool breeze off the lake to engulf me. And then I heard from a group that was in the water that the water was cold. And there were lots of folks out, lots of folks experiencing community, and some were there by themselves just trying to relax. People everywhere, people of God, the Holy Spirit is inviting us in. The Holy Spirit wants to touch us. The Holy Spirit wants us in. The Holy Spirit wants our participation, and it wants us to trust that the Spirit, the Spirit, has us in the water. Don't just come and never put your feet in. Don't just walk all the way up and never get in. The Holy Spirit wants us to step from passivity into participation, step from the margins to the center, step from the, outside, from the inside to the outside into the world. The Spirit wants us to step from fear to faith. The disciples were on a new journey, one in which they had never been on before. It's one thing to travel the same path. You know, I know that way. I know how to get up, and I know how to get to the north side. I know where I'm going. I know how to get out to Oak Brook. But it's a whole other thing when you're on a journey and on a path, and you're going somewhere you've never been before. And so the disciples were a little bit anxious. They had always had the security of Jesus, and now they didn't. The violence of his death was still fresh in their memories. They were untreated, traumatized disciples. No pedaling, no bikes, no water, just fear and a call to wait for it. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait. And they waited and the Spirit, the Spirit came. And they were different after the Holy Spirit. Their experience of the Holy Spirit deposited them in to a space where they had the courage to proclaim good news to the world of their times. Are you on the edge? What good news do you have to proclaim to the world? What message has God given to you specifically? It's your message. Are you ready to pedal? Are you ready to put your feet in the water, even if the water is cold? Are you ready to stop standing on the edges, never really participating? What work does God have for you to do? And don't tell me you retired in too old, please. What's holding you back? And now we can clearly see after this Pentecost day, something has changed for the disciples. The gospel saying says, I know that I have been changed. I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done changed my name. Here in this text, they were speaking in tongues. That was the experience for them. But it might be another experience for you where the Holy Spirit shows up and shows out. And you know you're not alone in this big world. You've got an advocate. You've got help. I laughingly say that there is before child and there is after child because literally after child, everything changed in my life. There's before Holy Spirit and there's after Holy Spirit. There's a shift too for the disciples. You know, the disciples look one way before the Holy Spirit comes. They're timid, they're scared, but they look different after the Holy Spirit comes. There's I 
heard about the Spirit, and then there's, I know the Holy Spirit for myself. Pentecost is the shift between not having a clue and having an arch in your back. There's, I want to trust, and then there's, I trust Jesus. There's being in the tail light, and then there's being the headlight. There's always putting on the brake, and then there's the pedal. The power of the Holy Spirit is not just the power to jump and run and flip over pews and speak in tongues. But the power of the Holy Spirit is that spiritual energy, spiritual impetus to do what you have not done, to go where you have not gone, to try what you have not tried, and to achieve what you have not achieved. You can just sit on the bike, but you got to paddle. You got to participate. You got to put your feet in the water. The advocate is able most of us think that we got to go through life on our own terms. We think it's all up to us. We rely totally and completely on ourselves, and we are exhausted. We are tired of trying to do this all by ourselves. Pentecost is all about knowing we have help. We have real help. We have an advocate. We have someone to help us. After all, Jesus assured the disciples, I'm leaving, but you wait for it. I'm sending you some help. We don't have to do this journey alone. Wait for it. The Holy Spirit is worth waiting for, and so the disciples, they wait. Well, I began today talking about the year we decided to learn how to ride our bike. There was a point A, and there was a point B, and there was a whole lot of stops in between point A and point B. That's what life is all about. You can determine that you want to get from this point to that point, and then there's all these interruptions. I say that also about DIYs, do-it-yourself projects. They make it look so easy, and then you try to do it, and it's so hard to do. That's life. But the summer of years ago, we started off not knowing how to ride a bike. But Noah had never built an ark, and Moses had never crossed the sea, and the disciples had never done ministry without Jesus Christ. We had all the desire to ride, but desire is not enough. No matter how much I pushed Josiah, pushing was not enough. No matter how much I wanted him to ride, wanting him to ride was not enough. No matter how much he wanted to ride, wanting to was not enough. He had to put some action in it. He had to hit some bumps. He had some crashes, and he wanted to give up. But no, no mud, no lotus, no pedaling, no movement, no aim no finish line, no pain, no gain, no prayers, no power, no waiting, no Holy Spirit. No waiting. You want to be impatient? Go on without the Holy Spirit. No waiting, no Holy Spirit, no advocate. By the end of the summer, we knew how to ride our bike. And he's never, ever forgotten. Wait for it. Amen.